Sea Shock, crazy alien looking watches, retro tastic options with a touch of sophistication versus Casio, move aside Siri and Alexa, Citizen had voice recognition covered in the 80s, Datalink, pa, I give you the Hyper Aqualand, and Anna Digi Temp. I give you Citizen electronic watches. After you watch this video, you'll realize that you should be considering them in the same breath as Casio, Timex and Seiko for digital awesomeness, and that's without even fully considering their broader contributions to watchdom. Let's take a 1300 meter plunge into Citizen from the beginning up to the 2000s. Before we begin on the electric fun, let's build up a bit from the origins of Citizen. Now, Mr. Yamazaki started the Shishoka workshop around 1918, which after some initial pocket watch production would evolve into Citizen Watch Co. in 1930. Named as such by Tokyo Mayor Shinpei Goto, based on the desire for all citizens to get hold of their watches. After damage to their operations during World War II, Mr. Elichi Yamada would pick over post-war production and showed a flair for large market stunts, such as the Parashock in 1956, which was dropped 30 meters from a helicopter to show its shock resistance. A similar stunt was performed with the 1959 Parawater watch, which they claim was Japan's first water-resistant watch. A movement factory of Citizen would be opened in Miyota, hence the name, in 1959, which would later go on to become a movement powerhouse that you'll still here of today. Citizen takes the in-house capability stuff very seriously, which is one of the reasons I find it a bit odd why they aren't given a bit more love by the watch enthusiast community. But let's start ramping up the dive into the aspect that I'll be primarily focusing on in this video, which is electronic watches. In 1962, Citizen would set up the Tokorozawa Research Laboratory, which would do the groundwork for the development of the Cosmotron X8, with the X meaning unknown and the 8 representing infinity. How cool. With the first model being launched in 1967 with calibers 0801, very retro, and 0802, the Cosmotron Chronotron Chronometer. The Cosmotron would have various additional iterations into the 70s with the world's first use of titanium being claimed in 1970 in the 0820. Now 1972 would see Citizen developing its own version of a tuning fork watch, enabled by its long-term collaborator Bulliver, who had of course developed the Accutron Space View. In 1973, Citizen would start to bridge its way over over to quartz with the 8810, which was an electromechanical movement that had quartz regulation, with later models using regular quartz, with a fun model being the 8600 known as the Blinker that had an LED light at the top that flashed every hour. A pretty amazing feat was the Citizen Quartz Crystron Mega Caliber 8650 with a gold case that was and is very expensive. This was a crazy high frequency and was accurate to within three seconds per year. The Crystron name, which had been applied to their clock range from as early as 1967, would be the name for their first field effect LCD watch, the Crystron LC9010 caliber in 1974. 1975 would see a token LED watch using a Sanyo module with the Quartz Crystron LED caliber 9002. In 1976, Citizen would release the world's first alarm function on an LCD watch with the 9021A, an E model in gold tone, and I liked this six-sided one and this cool vintage ad I thought was quite fun. The Citizen Digital Slim 9070 was apparently the thinnest LCD watch at that time in Japan. As it's in a similar vein, I'll also throw in 1978's 9120 with slim fiberglass printed circuit board. This is in line with their aims in the analog world as 1978 was the year where Citizen broke the one millimeter barrier during their attempts to develop the flattest watch in the world the 7,900 in the Exceed range. But 1976 was also a year of Citizen World First with the 8620A, being the world's first solar watch with hands. But back to digitals, and the 9060 from 1977 has a front display that looks slightly more complex with the day display and a few different variants, with the 9080 chronograph dual time adding those functions. An absolute classic was Citizen's fantastic Quartz Calculator LC watch 1990, claimed to be the first LCD calculator watch in the world. I'm breaking the timeline, but for ease here, is the 9130, the 9140 full dress calculator, and one with a stopwatch was the 9190 in 1978. A last fashionable number I'll bring in from 1977 was the Pierre Cardin collaboration of the time, who was receiving awards from Cartier at this point. Citizen continued leading the way in the alarm field with 1978's 9100A multi-alarm with multiple colour variants and branding that was linked to having an alarm on your watch being seen as the ultimate status symbol. 
1979 brings the 9101 Multi Alarm 2, with a slim line version being available later with the Multi Alarm 3 9240. Since as I'm on the theme, I'll bring in 1980's 9400 Multi Alarm World with full screen memo calendar. The so called Forefront 9200A Quartz Multi Alarm was available in 1979, as you can see from this cool poster, and it's so named because there are four buttons on the front. Duh. And I must admit, I did actually have to Google that. I'm skipping well ahead here, but for completeness sake, I'll mention Citizen's first melody alarm, which plays Foster's O oh Susanna, and also has an alphanumeric memory, hence the name Memo Melody. 1979 is when Anna Digi, or Digi Anna as it was to begin with, depending upon the model, really starts getting going with the 8900, or 89 series as it was known, with the very cool hexagonal analog mini display and the so-called L-shaped LCD panel. It had multiple cool colour variants, and the 8911 Chrono Alarm Chime model adds those functions as well as the illumination lamp. Digi Anna largely changes over to Anna Digi with the 8920 to meet the quote diversified needs of the contemporary gentleman, with the 8930 going even dressier. A fun model is a so-called time track with the calibre 8940 with so-called special form drilled LCD display and the 8943 robot is a popular one amongst collectors. Another super fun one is the 8970 nicknamed, you guessed it, the Mickey. The 9560 Pseudo Anna Digi goes fully LCD, with the later more advanced version being the 9610 Spectro, which apparently allows you to measure the intensity of the light. In 1982, we of course see the release of an absolute classic, and indeed the world's first temperature reading watch, the Anna Digi Temp with the 8980. The related modules are the 8982 and the 8984. In the 80s, you start seeing more sports style watches or multifunction style watches. The 9500 is where I start to see water resistance coming more into the front of their watches a bit more prominently, with this one stating 100 meter water resist. The 9510 is in a similar vein. Linked into the jogging craze, Citizen had their own pacemaker watch that helped you with your pace setting with the 9440, and all this sportiness comes into one package with the 9590, described as a full-scale sport-type digital, marketed as one of their leading options of this type. The next level up for cardio sport is the Citizen Biosports or Jogpoint D010 with pulse sensor. I think in the later 80s I've seen one from 1989, and available into the 90s was this smart plastic pulse meter, the D110. Broadening out to some other sports, first we have Motorsport, which had the D046, and we even have a football referee timer, the favourite of Casio, with the model P120. I'll fit in as well this awesome looking P110, or it may be a P100 steel square with 200 meter water resistance. Serial numbers I've seen for this watch are around 1986 or so. With there also being a high tide P110, now here is a total enigma for me, which is what a subscriber interestingly dubbed the Sea Shock which I think fits well with this P130. Now I believe that this was actually released initially in 1985, and this does fit with the timeline in that you see the G-Shock Square coming out in 1983. You'll note that this is listed as 300 meter water resistant, whereas the G-Shock Square was 200 meters, and it also had a circular version. A classic from 1985 is the Aqualand C020, with depth indication to 80 meters. The Sport Windsurfer is another super retro watch, which was available in 1985, I believe, with the D060 and D120 having both rectangular and circular versions. I think it's more towards the 90s, but I'll also bring in the D160 here. Other sport models are the D130, D132, and D150 in the shock sensor range for cycling and running, and the D131 for skiing. I've dropped in this 1993 Oxy model, which I thought was fun. Taking some of the graphical display elements of the windsurfer range, some fun references with these colour type models are the D050 and D041. The D42 gives me Wheel of Fortune vibes, and the D100 colour graphics with shock sensor came out in 1988. Another fashionable retro option, look at that strap, is the D80. So let's have a quick tech break. Now a classic piece of tech and favourite of collectors is the Quartz Anna Digi Voice Memo C010, with six whole seconds of recording time. Jumping forward a few years, in 1987 we see an amazing piece of tech, which is the VX2 D090 Voice Master, which was the world's first voice recognition watch with built-in microphone. I'm not 100% on this, but I know that at least 1985, as it's in the catalogue, is the D031 Citizen Radio Watch Soundwitch, I 
presume because it looks like a sandwich, although correct me if you know why. Very Dick Tracy style, in multiple cool colours and a detachable battery and headphone jack pack. How can you not love that? Okay, we've navigated through to the 90s. Outside of digital land, Citizen was still doing some cool stuff. 1993 sees a Citizen Multizone 7400, which was the world's first multiband radio controlled watch, with the fetching coiled receiver down the middle of the watch. In 1996, Citizen of course commercialised their legendary eco drive capability as an advancement from Citizen Solar. One I particularly like due to an interest in kinetic movements, see the video I did, is the eco drive duo that came out in 1998 that combined both technologies. But back to digital land, and indeed, in analogue land, the 90s would truly be the era of the ProMaster brand. Although technically that launched in 1989, dividing their watches primarily into sky, marine and land. 1989 saw the introduction of the C40 ProMaster Alticron, which included altitude, barometer and temperature resistance. The first batch of ProMaster models would include the Aerochron, which was a world-time watch and included a fun slide rule. Mixed in with the initial ProMaster models in the 1991 catalogue, we see the C80 world-time alarm for pilots, the C70 and the C50 designed for yachts. The 8948 tachymeter was also available around 1991. Now here is possibly my favourite, which is the Citizen Hyper Aqualand D1000 D200, 201 and 202. This was the world's first diving watch with depth display that transferred information to a PC via a cable and automatically read temperature every five minutes. An absolute classic and I want one. This C500 Air Diver is another of their marine models with a digital depth display, so cool because it's suitable for diving using air, aka scuba diving, rather than you diving out of a plane into the sea, which was my first fault. Moving back on land, the C310 ProMaster Land would appear around about this time, and moving up into the sky in 1994, we see the ProMaster Navihawk C300. Check out that crazy complicated watch face. Citizen collaborated with both the Blue Angels and Blue Impulse for these colour models. A fun 1996 model is the C420, with the latest C460 being in a similar vein. Now let's turn to the total madness that is the Citizen Independent series, a bonkers range of watches that ran from 1997 until 2003. Now here is the D390 from the Independent range, which included limited editions, the C351, the C480 series, which looks very weird, and there are a few variants of it in blue, red, and black at least. I was trying to think what they remind me of, and my conclusion is on the screen. Ditto for the 295 range, which came out in 97. Of course, Independent also did a couple of versions of the Anadigi Temp, with this one being my favourite. The D400 was one of the few instances where Citizen did LED. There were a whole bunch of versions, including collaboration models. These were in the so called GSD, or Graphic Sparkle Display range. The D380 range looks very alien-esque, or as which Watch Today blog calls it, radioactive, which was a suitable candidate for the Spawn collaboration based on the comic series. This is a C353 independent model, can't think of what it looks like so put in the comments if you've got a proposal. The C352, yes I know my lookalike suggestion is very tenuous. If you want a nerdy watch, the D420 has you covered, or you tell the time as an abacus or in a weird binary style format. A final crazy independent one that I'll throw in is the D600 with Eco Drive. Moving outside of independent, Vega and Oxy were sub brands that had an array of watches, including the C112. Here is a whole unicorn vomit range of colours in the early 90s, and Oxy also did this interesting C400 model later in the 90s. QN was another range with some very funky looking options, including the D298 and D391 models. Within that Glass D range, we have the D510 with chunky dot matrix and another very alien looking watch, the D28C. Glass D even did their own Anadigi Temp, which I thought was quite a nice one. Moving more into novelty, Citizen made a whole bunch of cartoon quartz watches in the 80s, but these fun examples of digital versions from the 90s catalogues I thought were worth sharing. And I love these Street Fighter 2 watches, the D180 and D181. Citizen beat Seiko to it. Last models where I wasn't 100% sure on the date but couldn't leave out are the D320 ProMaster Training Timer Memo, the D28A International Code Flags, and the circular version, the D28F. And that's it on this episode of the Illuminating Watches channel. Please do subscribe if you enjoyed, and if you like this video, I'm pretty sure you'd be interested in the video I've got listed on screen. I hope you have a great rest of your day.